Good evening. Um, I'd like to call the Tuesday, May 14th, 2013 meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District School Committee to order at 7.01 p.m. And the first order of business is to ask for a motion to go into executive session for purposes of discussing collective bargaining. May I have a motion, please? I make a motion that we go into executive session for purposes of collective bargaining. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. I need a uh, vote by person, please. Lawrence? O'Brien, aye. Baptiste, aye. Shabazz, um, abstain. Foley, aye. Capagan, aye. Fonch, aye. We are uh, adjourned to executive session and we shall return shortly. Five minutes.
I'd like to call back to order the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee uh, at, to regular session at 7.20. Um, I'd like to begin by reading a statement um, as follows. On behalf of the APAA and the districts, we are very pleased to announce that we have reached agreement in our contract negotiations with the APAA our administrators group, which currently consists of assistant principals, two special ed administrators, and the athletic director. The three-year contract, which commences July 1st, 2013, calls for cost of living increases of 0%, 1%, and 1% over the three-year term. We also agreed to work toward changes to the administrative evaluation process consistent with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education regulations. In addition, we have agreed to an amended longevity plan to recognize administrators who have long-term service in the districts. Both the APAA and our districts recognize the increasing educational demands and the challenging budget times we are facing. And we work together to come to a satisfactory agreement for both parties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would um, like to take care of a couple of sort of procedural issues before we proceed. First and foremost, I would like to uh, officially welcome Kathleen to um, the Regional School Committee um, and express my own personal um, um, looking forward to your sharing your experience, your expertise, your background, um, and as I indicated to you, I believe earlier in a, in a correspondence, um, your obvious commitment to the children of the district. So we welcome you and look forward Thanks. to working with you. Me too. Welcome. Thanks. Um, as you can see by looking around, um, we are undergoing, uh, we're in the process of transition, uh, which might last for, oh, a month or two, <laughs> <laughs> depending upon how things go. But um, I would like to take this opportunity just to remind people, both on the committee and in the audience this evening, as well as people at home who may be watching on TV, that these are the business meetings for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. This is the um, only time that we uh, um, can come together as a group to, co to conduct um, the very, very important educational and financial and governance business of the school district. And so it's important that we um, conduct our business in as efficient and as orderly a fashion as possible, while at the same time making certain that everyone who wishes to speak and contribute to an issue or a matter before the board has allow is allowed to speak. So I'm going to reiterate something that um, I've said before, um, but feel uh, compelled to say it again, and that is I am going to ask people who from the committee who uh, wish to be recognized to please raise your hand. Um, I will recognize you um, as um, I see fit in terms of the number of hands that may go up and also who has spoken and who hasn't spoken, that kind of thing, and try to respect everyone's willingness, desires um, in um, speaking before the board on any particular issue. So I am going to ask that you continue, as you have in the past, to observe that. Um, I'm also going to ask members of the committee um, to also remember that um, as, as, business, as, as representatives of uh, our communities, uh, it is not at all uncommon for uh, people in, of our communities to contact us about a concern or an issue either that affects a particular person or family or child, uh, but also may be seen by that person from our community as having a larger interest uh, within that community. I'm going to, again, remind members of the committee that when you are informed of those kinds of matters, uh, they should be communicated to both the chair and the superintendent um, for consideration of how to respond to those issues. Um, it's very, very important that um, we speak. Uh, we're, we're a collection of individuals, uh, but we're also a collective, and we need to speak as one voice. And so I am going to ask the members of the committee, and forgive me, but as we go through this transition period, I may feel uh, a need to say it again, and I apologize for being repetitive and redundant, um, but I am going to ask members of the committee to please make sure that you follow that procedure so that um, if a response is, is necessary, 
um, that it can come with uh, one voice from either the chair and or the superintendent. Um, so I would ask that you, you do that. Um, I'm also going to pass out, <coughs> pass around, I'm not going to pass out, um, but I am going to pass around uh, the warrants. Um, we have, as uh, we always do, confiscated your automobiles until you make sure you sign these. So please make sure you sign them as they come around. Um, I also, I'm not sure if the superintendent is going to say anything, but I'm going to mm -hmm. preempt the superintendent and express publicly congratulations to Sharon Palmer, mm -hmm. um, the 2013 teacher who received the 2013 Teacher Award from the Connecticut Valley Section of the American Chemical Society, um, chemistry teacher at Amherst mm -hmm. Palm Regional High School, um, an extraordinary honor both for, of course, for uh, Ms. Palmer, but also I think for the department as well as for the high school, a truly extraordinary recognition of uh, excellence in teaching and education. Um, next, I'm going to ask the members of the committee to review the agenda. Um, I'm going to make one slight possible change, and that is when we get to 3B. Uh, Rob Detweiler is going to make a brief presentation about um, the OPEB liability trust agreement proposal. Um, you'll notice that it says it's for discussion. I am going to ask the committee, um, and I will ask um, the committee to make the decision whether or not it wants to vote on this particular proposal this evening. That is not a requirement. I'm simply going to ask if you are ready to vote tonight if you wish to do that. Otherwise, we will postpone that vote. But he is going to make that presentation later this evening. Other than that, does anyone see any items on the agenda that they wish more time to be spent on? Not hearing any. I'm also going to turn your attention to the calendar. Um, we only have about a month and a half left of the school year but the um, amount of business that we need to take care of over the course of the next month and a half is really continues to be extraordinary. The budget is behind us, uh, but our work is not finished, and I would include amongst the most significant tasks that of the evaluation of the superintendent. So um, we, have, we are going to have to pay close attention to the final month and a half of the calendar. So with that, I'll ask if there's any public comment from members of the audience. Not hearing any from the <laughs> assembled multitude. Um, I will turn attention to the superintendent who has some announcements. Yes, I do. I'm going to go around you, Patrick. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, since you took one of my highlights of the evening, no, it's great. It's less for me to, to speak to. So uh, a couple quick things. I just want to um, remind the community of the Amherst Education Foundation am annual sp spring sprint, which is Saturday the 18th. And that will be a 5K run or walk. Um, and that starts at 10 a.m. Um, and I believe it starts at Wildwood Elementary School. Also, we have our seventh annual Latino Achievement Night, which is Friday, May 17th at the Middle School Auditorium. And the celebration begins at 6.30 and recognizes our students K through 12 for academic effort and progress, leadership, and community spirit. And there's lots of performances that happen that evening with our students, and we hope people will come and join us. Um, also, the Amherst Human Rights Commission is seeking nominees for their Human Rights Youth Heroism Award. And Amherst students who are in K through 12 can be nominated for demonstrated acts of kindness, unselfishness, and community service. I absolutely love this, this award. So um, we hope we will see many of um, our students nominated. And letters of, the, of nomination are due to the committee by May 31st, and the winners will be celebrated in a community gathering in June. There's an attached letter for you just so that you can see more information about um, this nomination. Also, um, uh, Camilla uh, Carpio, I believe is how we pronounce her last name. Camilla is one of our students at the high school, and she received first place in the Northwestern um, District Attorney's Spoken Word Contest. So we want to recognize and celebrate Camilla. Um, she's a member of POKU and, M and an MSAN scholar. And her work is entitled Eliminate Moments of Silence. And you can view that on um, YouTube, and the, the, um, the address is there, or the, is that what you, how you call it, the, the YouTube address? I guess that's what you would say. URL. URL, thank you, is there for people to be able to um, take a look. And, and we um, thank Camilla for all of her hard work in our schools and recognize her, 
her talents. Um, we also have a mixed media artwork award. Our high school senior Natalie Schuler Moss will be featured at the Center for um, Arts in Natick on May 16th. And the event will celebrate the creative forces behind the Massachusetts High School Magazine of the Arts. So we'd like to um, recognize her and her selection is entitled The Lonely One. So congratulations um, to Natalie. Um, our chorale um, has been recognized, um, as many of you know, under the direction of Anita Cooper. They won the best, uh, the award for best overall ensemble um, at WGVY um, Together in Song series, and they will be performing for us on the 28th. So we will, yes, I know. We said, they said one song, I said, oh no, two. So they'll be coming here to um, allow us to be inspired because they are so inspiring. Uh, we also just want to mention that our Vela Scholar Summer Program is happening this summer again at the middle school, which is a free three-week academic and enrichment opportunity for our rising seventh graders and our eighth grade students. Um, so this is a, a wonderful opportunity for academic projects, building relationships with the middle school faculty, um, enrichment led by Amherst College interns, and the program runs from 8.30 to 2.30, Monday through Friday, July 8th through the 26th, with transportation and lunch provided. So more information can be found on our website. Um, a few more congratulations. One is to Dave Rainin, and I am not going to do a great job with Kristen's last name. Debbie, do you know Kristen's last name? Oh, it's the second page up in the top. I'm going to allow you to see who can do that well. Okay, Kristen Dolce. I know. Okay, I'll do that. Who were recognized recently by the Harold Grinspoon Pioneer Valley Excellence in Teaching Award? Um, we really appreciate when our teachers are recognized for the exceptional work. Um, that they do in our schools. So congratulations to Dave and to Kristen. Also, um, Dr. Norman Price, one of our middle school science teachers, has defended his dissertation, and we are now all calling him Dr. Price every time we see him. And I will allow you to read the amazing work that um, he has put together, which his presentation, he presented his paper at the National Association of Research and Science Teaching, um, a conference this past April. So congratulations to Dr. Price. Um, we also have our students, uh, which specifically Team Greylock, will be going to Groff Park. And this is a field trip that was sponsored in part um, through AEF, a grant that funded a program with Rushing Rivers Institute in Amherst. And this is an interdisciplinary trip where our students move through six different stations and they're um, having the opportunity to take samples of life forms and learn about ecology in the natural setting. Um, so again, we always thank AEF for the opportunity, and I know that this is um, a wonderful opportunity for our students that they've greatly appreciated. Um, and our last announcement is our seventh grade English students have recently written integrated social studies and science essays, and some of the students worked um, on informal essays about issues affecting uh, Caribbean or Central um, America. And these essays are, will be collected and in a book <coughs> and on display in the middle school library. <coughs> And we have some of our other seventh graders who wrote analytical essays comparing the identity development of young people growing up around Jerusalem in the documentary Promises and in the novel Habibi. So, um, and these students are highly impressive as always. Um, and I would welcome people to come and take a look at their work. So lots of recognition, again, at this time of the year. It's so much fun to spend time acknowledging not only our faculty and staff who are exceptional, but our students. Um, so this is a, a great time for celebration. So again, um, school committee members, we'd love to have you come to as many of the opportunities to recognize our students as possible. Are there any comments or questions? Yes, yes Kathleen. Um, I missed the last meeting, so I don't know if it was said, but also um, Linda Castronova and Emily Fry of Fort River got the Harold Grinspoon Teaching Award as well. Thank you. So I just wanted to make sure that they got recognized. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, I don't believe it was noted at the last, was well, it? I think it, um, it wasn't noticed. It at yeah. the last meeting. That's right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I greatly appreciate it. So we recognize our teachers. And I think we have an opportunity to recognize some of our other staff later in our agenda. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, thank you You're very, very much. Welcome. That's a very impressive set of announcements. Thank I know. you. It's always so much fun. Um, Rob, I'm going to ask you to come up and uh, make the uh, presentation on the third quarter FY13 budget update.
if I may, before you do that, I'd like to thank both you and Maria for um, the very professional, um, steady, and informed presentation of the FY14 budget uh, and responses to questions at last night's Amherst Town meeting. Um, I also want to thank members of the committee who attended. Um, it was roughly two and a half hours of mm -hmm. presentation and responses to questions. Um, and I thought um, the performance was uh, exemplary. And I want to personally thank you very, very much for, for being um, operating and functioning at that high quality and high level. Thank you very much. Rob, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you will have copies of the fourth, the third quarter report. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You pack it. Okay. Yeah, we'll pass out more paper then. Um, essentially, this is really good news. So mm -hmm. we're going to spend a whole lot of time here. I've I've jotted down um, some of the changes that happened during the course of the year. As you know, we form a budget you know, now or in November, just January. And then the, ro the year rolls out and things happen, things change, and we have to reallocate funds, other funds get freed up, uh, and so forth. So I pretty much listed out on this report what happened and what, where it went and so forth. Um, but I want to just highlight where we're ending up. Um, and we're not ending up in a very nice place. When we formed the budget uh, for next year, we were looking to have perhaps $50,000 left at the end of this year that could go into E&D and be used to support the next year's budget. Well, things have happened since then, including uh, premium holiday for uh, health insurance, both for employees and retirees, um, which um, freed up $338,000, not insignificant. When the tr Amherst Health Insurance Trust Fund did that, the idea was to um, take those funds and put them into the OPEB Trust Fund of the entities. So Amherst has an OPEB Trust Fund, and they voted at town meeting to put the money in there. Pelham has an OPEB Trust Fund, and so they're moving their stuff into there. Um, region doesn't have an tr OPEB Trust Fund, so we can't do that. But we could let that uh, go back into E&D and be available for future allocation to OPEB Trust Fund or future budget support. So instead of 50000 being left at the end of the year, we'll have that amount to drop down as well. Um, of the remaining funds that we have there, um, we knew we were going to have some left, and as part of the FY14 budget, we factored in prepaying retirement uh, obligations of 117,000. Um, so with the um, premium holiday money dropping down into ND, we still have about $55,000 unaccounted for to get us through the rest of the year, which mm -hmm. is comfortable. Um, I say that because every year we cut off, there's a cutoff date when um, staff can submit requests for purchase orders. That date is tomorrow. So as of once they all get processed by the end of the week, we'll know really where we stand. And it's going to be, you know, not exactly here, but pretty close to this. Mm -hmm. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to go into it. But that's the good news. Any comments or questions? Shabazz. So the <clears throat> Could speak a little more on the, the how this premium holiday emerges, mm -hmm. um, the Ed Jobs funding, the um, other ways in which uh, these these holidays occur, in in terms of it being something that isn't we aren't able to anticipate. I'd imagine. Sure, that's right. Um, <coughs> so let me do the Ed Jobs first because it's a little piece. Um, mm -hmm. We thought we had. Ex Expended the last of the Ed Jobs grant last year. It turns out that there was an ineligible amount, so we hadn't used it up, and we had that little bit dribble off into this year. That's how we used it up. Now the premium holiday is um, uh, a decision by the uh, Health Insurance Trust Fund Board um, to look at uh, the um, the fund, the trust fund itself. And so what happens is for the last couple of years, we've had a really good uh, 
experience, uh, claims experience, meaning that we are collecting at least as much in premiums as we need to pay out the, uh, the costs, okay? And as a consequence, two things have happened. We've had a 0% increase in health insurance premiums for the last two years, uh, which is good. Okay. And still, um, the fund balance has been growing. So the question becomes, what do you do with that? Well, you could leave it there, because um, we know at some point, of course, uh, the experience is going to catch up with us, and we're going to have to start raising rates again. Um, hopefully not as bad as the uh, national trend, but at some point. Um, and what balances there can help to soften that, perhaps. But there is a large balance there. And so the thought, thinking was, gee, we also all have these OPEB uh, trust fund obligations. It would be proper to transform into that uh, venue for future liability on retiree health insurance premiums. Other comments or questions? Lawrence. So we can ask questions about the whole the budget that we got. So yes, I have sure. a question about. A couple of times uh, it's mentioned that there were three unfilled special ed positions that were then filled. What's the status of that? I don't know. Well, but for, uh, particularly I was thinking for next year, uh, are we going to attempt to fill those positions and then have we budgeted accordingly for those? Yeah, it's all budgeted for. Mm -hmm. uh, is, yeah. What happens you know, during the course of a year, you get to a certain point, it doesn't make sense to hire somebody for a portion of the year and go through all of that. Yeah. It's just easier to fill with uh, contract. a contracted service, mm -hmm. you will. Okay. Can I have ask a follow-up? Mm -hmm. Do we know why it was difficult to fill it? I know that with special ed, it's very difficult to find <laughs> basically people for positions. It's I, I think one of the positions was specifically hard to fill. It was, a, I think, an ABA position applied, you know, a behavior okay. analyst, mm -hmm. which yep. is they're few and far between. Right. So it took us a bit there. I can't remember what the other positions were off the top of my I, head, I can't either. I don't know which ones were hard to fill and which were just a matter of timing that it didn't mm -hmm. make sense to, yeah. to hire. And typically what we do at that point is that it is the shifting of the funds because we're looking yeah. at contracted services through special education mm -hmm. versus uh, filling the position. And yeah. But all positions have been posted and we are okay. actively in the hiring process. That was my next question. Thank yes. You. Yep. Okay. Yes, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Shabazz. And with respect to the way food services was um, budgeted at 70, but has come in <coughs> at this point at 101, um, uh, 100, the explanation presented had to do with increase in the cost of food itself, <coughs> so that there's nothing related to our provider in that or no no the providers uh, on a uh, fixed fee uh, which has not increased in five years um, it's uh, it's a matter of um, um, costs it's a matter of participation um, and the new standards require um, good stuff you know fresh fruits fresh vegetables um, a, a wide assortment and Pretty much uh, food service um, departments throughout the state, if not country, I don't know about the country, but state, I know, um, are struggling to make ends meet because of the increased costs. One of the, um, and that's pretty widely known, so the USDA had provided an option to apply uh, for an extra six cents per meal, which required documentation of menus, what we're serving, how it's served, you know, the whole thing. Um, and we, so we did that uh, back in the fall and qualified to get that six cents. So it helped, uh, but it doesn't close the gap. But it's good for the kids. <laughs> and the, um, do we ever look at whether um, the, the children are actually eating all what we're, you know, that there, there isn't a waste factor? And because you can change, mm -hmm. you know, menus and put new things in and require them to have certain things. And if they're not eating it, you yeah. know, then it's, it's waste, mm -hmm. I'd imagine. Exactly. And it's fascinating. So fascinating. <laughs> we start this year. Um, let me go back a couple, couple years. 
um, before we had to, and we're ahead of the curve in some ways, it's not too difficult for us to come into the new standard compared to some districts. A couple years ago, we moved to uh, all whole wheat um, product, no white. So pizza, for instance, went from like near white crust pizza to whole wheat crust pizza. And a popular line, I we eat at the middle school, so I watched the lines at the middle school. I can't speak for the rest of them. A popular line, and all of a sudden it just dried up because it was whole wheat crust. You know. And then after a couple of months, um, I think they started realizing that that's pretty tasty stuff. You know, it's got some flavor to it. It's, uh, it's got a nuttiness to it, and it became more popular than ever. So that's just one of those learning curves. Okay, fast forward to this year. This year, a kid is not allowed to leave the line unless they have a fruit on the tray and two vegetables and all this stuff. Well, they're not used to eating fruit, but they couldn't leave the line unless they had a fruit on the tray. So they took it. And to their credit, they said, you know, this is, you know, we don't want to throw it out. It's a waste of food. So what do you do? So they set up uh, a sharing table. Right? So you don't want the stuff. You had to have. You have to take it. You don't have to eat it. If you don't want to eat it, you can put it on the sharing table. Somebody can take it for a snack later, take it home, whatever. And we wrap our, wrap our apples in plastic wrap and so forth for health reasons. So that, that was a big thing for a while uh, in the fall. Well, it's going to dwindle off. Now they're starting to eat the stuff. So <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a learning curve. There's an experimental curve, uh, you know, but it, it, it moves along. It's hard to take up so much time. I think it's fascinating <laughs> to watch these guys, you know, just kind of feel their way along. Mm -hmm. If I may, um, as a member of uh, the subcommittee that was involved with uh, designing the RFP for food vendors for next year, the conversations that we had in the subcommittee about adolescent, pre-adolescent eating habits was a fascinating experience, um, as well as the, the sort of the economics of trying to provide uh, as healthy um, a, um, a lunch as is possible. Um, it's a fascinating experience. And I was, I'm wondering, Rob, can you share with us where that process is at the moment as we speak? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was a couple, three weeks ago, we released the RFP, having noticed it in papers and through the state outlets and so forth. Uh, we received uh, six, I think it was, requests for the proposal itself. Uh, we shipped them off. Uh, they were due back... Um, Two weeks ago, Friday, so okay, a week and a half ago, um, and we only got two responses. Two two vendors show. I'm sorry, they didn't send them back. They had to show up for a mandatory meeting, so that we could take the representatives around to each of the kitchens. They could see what the facilities looked like, what the equipment looked like, what the layout was, so they could make an intelligent proposal to us. Only two companies showed up. Uh, a disappointment. Uh, we know both companies, so okay. Um, we reserved a large yellow bus to take everybody around, but we needed a van. Um, the proposals themselves from the two companies are due this Friday and then next week uh, the Food Service Committee will get together and review uh, the proposals and uh, rank them, rate them against the rating criteria that the committee had developed before we issued the RFP itself. So that'll, that'll go on um, and we'll probably invite some finalists back to interview them in person. Uh, make a final decision and hope to bring a recommendation to this committee on June 8th. I, I would also add, if I may, that the contributions of the community members to the subcommittee in terms of um, incorporating very specific, explicit expectations, demands, if you will, into the RFP in terms of locally produced food, organic food, natural mm -hmm. food, healthy food, and so on and so forth, was really uh, extraordinary to um, be a part of that. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't contribute as much as I would have liked to, nor as much as the members of the community contributed, uh, but it was, um, uh, I, I think, a, a process that resulted in um, a document that people had to respond to that I think I would, I would say that everyone at this table would feel good about in terms of uh, doing what we could to ensure as much as possible that kids would be receiving a nutritious meal, a healthy meal, um, and also one that would be um, uh, pleasing to the taste. Mm 
as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll, I'll be very interested to see which, what these two companies come up with because the effort that went into producing the RFP, uh, particularly on the part of the community members, was really, really very, very thoughtful. Um, ver quite an experience. Yeah. That's very good. Thank you, Rob. Um, let me ask, if I may, sure. um, since we'll be coming forward with a recommendation on June 8th, um, would it be useful to you to see a copy of the RFP before then? I don't want to chop down mm -hmm. trees unnecessarily, but if you think it would be interesting, you know, we can bring a stack of these things to the next meeting and you can look them over. I think, yes, yes. I think it would be on the um, 11th, the 11th yes. not the 8th. June 11th. Oh, okay. June the 11th yes. is our next <coughs> meeting. So. Could, could we ask to have it sent to us, like with the packet, maybe, or even an it, email, so we can look through it? It's like pretty a, big. On, on the computer. It's pretty big. Okay. But can you do electronically? Or That's no? what I meant. Yeah, electronically, so that we can look at it. Because reading it here is hard to talk about it. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. But I thought we could bring it to uh, meetings before. Well, I guess we can. The 11th. I see. Yeah. The 11th. Okay. Okay. I'll Thank we'll you. Thank you. Email would probably be great. Yeah. Email. Yep, sure. Yeah. Any other comments or questions on the um, third quarter budget update? If not, then I'm going to ask Rob to stay right where he is mm -hmm. and proceed to the OPEB liability trust agreement. And again, um, just as prologue, um, I'm very sensitive to the notion of not asking people to vote on something without having due notice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm perfectly okay if you're not comfortable voting on what he is going to be presenting this evening. However, um, the reason why I would even entertain voting on the proposal is because of time. Um, we need to move forward in the development of a policy regarding this trust fund. And what I would um, envision being able to do is the policy subcommittee is meeting on the 23rd of this month. If we could craft a policy related to this proposal on that day, we can present it to you for the first reading on the June 11th and then the second reading on June 25th so we could wrap it up in time for the fall when we begin the next budget process. So that's sort of what my thinking is in terms of planning ahead and forward. However, I certainly respect um, anyone on the committee feeling that they don't have sufficient time to vote, and I want to respect that. But I also want to make it clear that if it's the wish of the committee, we can do so this evening. Correct? Um, if we didn't vote on it, would that preclude you making a policy on it? Yes. And I, I, I don't say that to put mm -hmm. pressure on you to vote. We can certainly... Because I, I was that. just... The way I could would consider it, a policy would be, you know not approved unless we vote on it, and it's a hypothetical. And if you made a policy about a hypothetical thing, you know, it's all in the same bag. We can just, we can look at the policy and say if we could approve a trust, you know, uh, 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 despite whatever you put in a policy, or we can approve a trust considering what you've put in the policy. Uh, I understand, and I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, let me ask you to do this. Let, let's put a hold on that mm -hmm. until we've heard of the proposal and then we can consider the process afterwards that we might want to deal with that. Okay. Okay? Uh, I just want you to know what the, sort of the parameters of our discussion are. That's all. But thank you. That's a good point. Thank you. Rob? Okay. So we've talked about this quite a while now, um, and I don't know, Ms. Trabhagen, how much you've heard about I'm new to it. OPEB. I'm reading. <laughs> okay, good. So what is OPEB? Um, it stands for Other Post-Employment Retirement Benefits. Um, and it has to do with when we have staff workforce, um, we, part of the agreement is that when they retire, um, they are eligible to continue receiving health insurance through their employer, us, and the employer will pay a percentage of their premium. Well, um, someone retires at age 50, um, then the district is on the hook for paying a percentage of their premium um, for <coughs> decades. Okay, and that's a lot of people build up over time. Um, every two years, well, let me step back. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, the accounting board um, specified that uh, public entities, towns, cities, school districts had to start reporting in their financial statements uh, what that outstanding liability, if you will, is or approximates. Um, 
So if you were fully paying, um, setting aside funds to pay those obligations in retirement, you would have a lot of money set aside. But what we all in government do is just pay the premiums that are due that year and never mind setting aside for future premiums. So that, that is why there's outstanding obligations for future liabilities that haven't been funded. And we don't have to fund them, but we do have to report what that obligation looks like. And so we do, an, uh, do this actuarial study every two years. And the regional school district at this point is like 32 million that would need to have set aside to be fully funded as a fully funded pension would be. Well, that's impossible. But um, what the um, what is not yet required, but may be at some point, is that we start to make some motions to addressing that obligation. Meanwhile, as a region, as a city, town, uh, we also are looking at what the impact of these regulations is on our bond rating. And if bond rating agency uh, looks at our financial situation or anybody's financial situation and sees that nothing's happening and we're burying our heads and it looks like we're avoiding the issue, it's going to be a negative point of view. If it looks like we've set up a trust fund and we have, are in the process of fully funding it and putting, you know, a million dollars in every year to get up to where we need to be, they're going to be very happy and give us a plus tick. If they see that we have started to address it and have set up a fund and maybe there's a few bucks in there and uh, we put in uh, dollars when they've come our way without stretching us because Lord knows nobody has extra dollars to put in there, uh, then they'll say, well, at least they're trying and they're aware of it and they're not ignoring it and they're doing the best they can. So that's, that's part of the reason for doing something is to address um, the rating agencies when they look at us. Okay. So more and more cities, towns, districts are catching on to that and setting up these funds. So now we're in some ways competing at the f with the folks who are looking at us. Well, you know, are you in that group that is doing something or are you in that group that is not doing something? So it's a little hazy, <coughs> but that's pretty much where we are. So t tonight, and what we've been talking about lately is just setting up the trust fund. And we can, at some future time, uh, decide if we want to fund it partially, fund it occasionally, um, or what. So let me address that a little bit. Um, Amherst is um, funding it uh, systematically as part of their budget, and that's okay. Uh, Pelham is funding it on occasion as um, funds become available. Um, we could, if we had a trust fund set up, put that holiday, premium holiday money in there, <coughs> or we could decide not to. Okay. But if we had a fund, we could. The other thing if we had a fund we could do is uh, capture some of the refund money that the health insurance trust fund gets from Medicaid Part D. So you pay for uh, retiree um, um, me medical, uh, yeah, not med uh, medicine, pharmaceuticals, and we get reimbursed a portion of that. Okay. So Amherst wants to put that reimbursement into their OPEB. Okay. And that is actually specified as one of the things that you can do and should do. If we had a fund, we could capture the portion that's being refunded based on the regional district's retirees and put that money in when that comes through. Not a large <coughs> amount. I think it's like $17,000 know, a year. But it, it, why not capture it? Put it in there. It shows some kind of growth, even though it's not planful, um, but it's better than nothing. So I am advocating that we set up a trust fund and then decide what to do with it. So uh, last time we met, we had a couple questions, and one was, <coughs> can we change um, how the trust fund works? And, uh, and the other question was, if there's something catastrophic happen, can we access that money to help us out in the situation? So I called our attorney and ran both by, and you have his comments on this memo. Um, the answer is you can change the 
the trust agreement within the parameters of the trust agreement, it still will only be able to be used for retiree benefits, but how you manage it, who administers it, that sort of thing, you can change around. Um, and if you get in a tight space, you could use funds that are in that fund to pay for retiree benefits, because that's what it's for. So that could relieve pressure if need be for other budget mm -hmm. situations. So the other thing that's in your packet is a draft uh, agreement uh, that our attorney provided and went over with him way too many times. <laughs> um, so I bring this for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions and see where we are. Questions? Um, let's see where I'm, I'm going to make Trevor? sure. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I'm trying to remember the hand raising. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that I am um, clear on the, the, the ways of funding it that you're advocating. I'm understanding now that Medicaid Part D is trickling the bucket, but you know over time could accumulate. Um, I'm understanding any uh, <clears throat> um, budget surpluses we have, we're going to decide to allocate a portion of it. Currently, our budget surpluses we put in a fund that revolve so that um, I forget the name that you described it to me before, um, but uh, the fund, the slush fund sort of that we <laughs> use. No what did you call it before? <laughs> <laughs> no slush funds. It, yeah. it, it, it remains it part of the uh, general fund balance. The general we fund balance. We call it E&D &D if it's not e &D. reserved for something else. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to yeah. think of, the E&D fund. Right. Am I, to understand it, you're also prescribing that we can take some of our E&D fund and put it in this if we so chose? Good. Um, and then um, finally, those two influxes of money, the managers of the trust could decide how to try to grow that money, how to invest that money or what that money could do to grow without putting more money in it just on top of it. Is that the case? Uh, no. Um, okay. The trust fund would be managed by the district treasurer mm -hmm. uh, who would invest the money on behalf of the uh, board. Um, and the financial advisors, of course, but it's a very conservative kind of move. At this point, we would look to uh, put anything we have with the uh, MMDT, the Massachusetts Depository Trust, um, which has very low return, but we would need to have a quarter million dollars before we get into any actual gain or maybe so. returns. Mm -hmm. um, at which point, I would suggest that we um, team up with the uh, state OPEB fund. Um, and put it with them. Um, they passed legislation this past year which allows uh, towns, cities, towns, and districts to join them uh, as with a separate account in their fund. Um, but they have a, an entry requirement of a minimum of a quarter million dollars. So it could take us some time to get ready to be in that. So what you're suggesting is between now and when we have a quarter million dollars, which if we're just putting 17,000 a year, plus anything we decide to take mm -hmm. off the top of E&D, could take quite some time. But until that point, the treasurer yep. would be investing it however the treasurer saw fit? Correct. Yeah. And it may not take that much time. Because we just looked, I mean, this year, we just had a premium holiday of 300,000. If that had dropped in, Bingo, you're, but you've got access. The lawyer did address that the trustees could de decide to invest it. No, the trustees <coughs> could not. Uh, delegate that to the treasurer, who was a bonded individual. And that's part of the um, outline of this thing? That's yep. not? Yep. Okay. okay. So actually, there's another document. Um, I handed it a little while ago. It's called Establishing an OPEB Liability Trust Fund. Yeah, right. And like, who does what and what the responsibilities are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Trevor, I mean, excuse me, Shabazz. What is our OPEP obligation look like and at what rate does it grow each year? Hmm. You know, I didn't bring that document with me, but it's, it's at about 32 million and it grows a couple of million a year. And it's just us, the regional, <coughs> for the regional school district. Correct. Mm -hmm. No, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So when we talk about this, and uh, some of us were at the presentation mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, actuarial uh, individual who did the study for us, and we met with the Amherst Finance Committee, and he points out, and if you read the report, it also points out that 
you calculate what the obligation is a certain way if you have a zero plan, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. and that inflates the number. If at the other extreme you are fully funding your plan, you use a different rate, and it's about half the obligation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you do something in between, of course, you in, in, uh, rate in between. So the actual number isn't that meaningful. The concept that we have an, a liability obligation to pay retirees, that is a fact, <coughs> um, and that will grow. Um, and it makes sense to address it at some point as we are able to. Because this is all in the context of an economy that is not generating a lot of extra dollars when we need to put stuff into our classrooms. So. That's why I'm going really easy on the funding and saying just, you know, we'll see what we can do, but let's at least set up the fund itself so we're making steps and showing the world that we are aware of, of the situation. Quick follow-up. Sure. And these are benefits beyond what they would expect as a state employee in terms of pension, life insurance, health care. There's something above and beyond that? No, that, no, no. Uh, the, the pension is taken care of by the pension boards, mm -hmm. whether it be the uh, uh, Teachers Retirement Board or the Hampshire County Retirement Board. Um, this deals with the health insurance portion and the life insurance portion. Health and life. The life insurance portion is very small. It exists, but it's small dollars. The health insurance is the big dollars one, and that's what this addresses. <coughs> Shabazz, all set? All set. Kathleen? So before this, what happened? It just, like, this bill gets paid every year, but then there's not a lot of planning about what the obligations are for the future? Correct. Mm -hmm. There's no provision for future obligations. <coughs> We're just paying what's coming due just this year. Just hoping that you can kind of meet keep the up, bottom line up each year. It. Yeah. Okay. And so, for example, where does the $17,000 go right now? It stays with the uh, health insurance trust fund because you don't have a place to move it to. So it's not available, for example, filling in other deficits in the school's budget? No. It's in the town. No. Because it's in the town. Oh. Yeah, in the, the health insurance trust fund is uh, a trust fund managed by the town of Amherst. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a self-insured health plan. And it covers the town of Amherst employees, town of Pelham employees, and the regional schools district employees who kind of banded together to have a health insurance pool. But so all, those, all those monies were paid for health insurance and they stay with health insurance. So at this point, your, your recommendation to do this really is to set ourselves up to be more prepared in the future. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. Yep. Annie? I just want to say I think I'd be happy to vote on this tonight and be comfortable with that because it's something we discussed and it's just a good thing for our district. So, uh, yeah. um, Before I go that route, I'd like to make sure that there are no other comments or questions. Lawrence? Uh, so at the last meeting, I think I was one of the persons who said we need to have this conversation. Uh, and I think this is a good start. I'm a little concerned that we're we're down in terms of school committee representation, but I don't, I think voting for this doesn't in any way inhibit or preclude having that conversation that we need to have about, you know, paying for our classrooms and what's the resources and the, the human resources and the other resources that are necessary in our classrooms. But at the same time, uh, we do need to be mindful that we, we have, I think someone at the, the presentation, uh, Mr. Stone's presentation mentioned that in a sense we have a covenant with our employees and I am, I am very concerned. Uh, this is part of our covenant with our employees. We pay them a salary and I think it's also important that we at least make a gesture uh, to say that we are living up to that covenant for their future care because that's what this meets. So I'd at least I'd be in favor of at least establishing the trust fund, and I hope that we have a conversation, because I know that yeah. there are other people on the committee who mm -hmm. at the Stone presentation had really some great insights, mm -hmm. and it would be a, a very worthwhile conversation. Yeah. I, oh, practically, I'm echoing that. You know, I think this is worthwhile to do, but the devil is in the details, and so when I read this draft, there were some provisions in this draft that I'd like to change, so if we voted on this today, it would be just to just to 
bring this into existence and we'd have future conversation on what the draft of it would be, or would we be voting on this draft, is my question, uh, to the chairman, I guess. Um, I'm seeing us, if there's a motion, the motion would be to adopt the draft. This draft, yeah, I don't want to adopt this draft. <coughs> Other comments or questions? Um, I'm not sure I'm hearing that the entire committee is ready to vote on a motion. However, I would like to add my own two cents very briefly. Um, I could not agree with you more, Lawrence, regarding an obligation. There are multiple obligations here, mm -hmm. one of which is to current students and making sure that we have sufficient funds to provide for a quality education, which is ongoing, mm -hmm. but not as obvious, not as directly in front of us is the obligation to people who've already moved on with their lives that we still have that covenant with. So that's point number two. And point number three, and uh, Rob alluded to it, I believe, earlier this evening, is that um, the absence of a good faith effort on our part, sooner rather than later, could have an impact on our bond rating. And uh, as an institution that has, as, a, as a, um, an organization rather, that is responsible for, among other things, um, a pretty valuable infrastructure that may and probably will require some significant renovations down the road that may necessitate borrowing, uh, I think we want to make certain that uh, we make every effort to create conditions where what we're going to be charged for that borrowing is as minimal as possible. Um, so I think uh, at some point soon, we're going to need to make a good faith effort here. Um, I do have, if I may, Rob, if, um, unless there are other comments or questions before, yeah, Lawrence, go ahead. So I have a, uh, so with Trevor, uh, you've, you've probably read it a lot closer. I, I read it and didn't have too many concerns, but I was wondering if this, Trevor's concerns can be met by the answer to this first question. Which is amending the Which is amending the agreement. Mm -hmm. Rob? Um, yes, you can amend the agreement to a certain extent okay. as to how to allow for changes in the conditions. So if we had an, an another, I can't imagine, but if we had another <laughs> obligation that we don't currently incur, uh, we could add that to this document. Yeah. Um, the nuts and bolts of how it works is fairly prescribed. Uh, you uh, alluded to can the trust fund board make investment decisions. That probably you can't change because they want to keep people, lay people out of that arena and put it to professional hands who is right. licensed and bonded and so forth. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, what I'd like to do, if we're not going to vote tonight, if I may, Take your questions, and I'll get them to the attorney and see what he says. Um, he's done a number of these for other districts uh, in the last year, um, and this is pretty much how they're all turning out because, you know, it's not, um, it's not a creative those, writing exercise. Along those lines, Trevor, I'm wondering if mm -hmm. um, perhaps if within the next three days, four days, members would email to you concerns mm -hmm. about the document All right. um, would that be um, yes I, I'm just my concern is that you know I am I am for doing this right. but I am I you know when I'm this part in particular I'm looking at and it's not a, a big deal I don't know if it, it would require input from the lawyer but the secession plan as it's outlined in this draft just doesn't seem to be robust enough you know of, of what mm -hmm. happens when a person leaves uh, the school board and, mm -hmm. and the secession to a new trustee. It's mm -hmm. just, it just seems, you know, bare bones and doesn't seem enough. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not opposed to the concept or the idea, but think to rush into this without thinking this through in terms of how this fits to us. What? Uh, I guess my, to put the question, you know, straightforward, when would the draft be finalized? Would an initial vote to make this, you know, happen, finalize this as mm -hmm. this draft is being now set in stone? Or is there another meeting we can have to discuss the nuances of how this works? Is what I'm asking. Rob? So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I asked them that question. So <laughs> the way it's set up is to make it as easy as possible. And the, the easiest way to do it is to have the school committee be the trustees. Um, and so what happens when somebody leaves the school committee? 
well, none of the school committee replaces them. And so that's what the secession thing is. Mm -hmm. Who has, whoever's on school committee is a trustee. And what he specifies is when a new person comes on, you sign, a, sign on to it, you know, putting your name to it, acknowledging that you are a trustee. That's all mm -hmm. there is to it. Um, he says it's advantageous, he likes to see as people leave, that they submit a paper that says they are also withdrawing from uh, the, the trust. But because of the way it's worded, you don't actually have to do that because if you're no longer a member of the school committee, you're not a trustee. So that, that's why it's worded that way. It's just to make it as easy as possible for the changing school committee composition. I'm just, there's nothing that's hard and fast that's wrong with that. But I'm just thinking it, I'm foreseeing some nuances that would make that, uh, 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 some details of that have to be spelled out. And that's, that's all I'm saying. That bef before I voted for this, I would like to know that the school board is willing to sit down and discuss those nuances and that it's not just that's it and we move on and not consider those factors. That's, that's, that's really what my concern is. Other comments or questions? If not, then I'm going to suggest mm -hmm. um, that members of the committee email mm -hmm. Rob over the course of the next week. Yeah, sure. Reasonable? Mm -hmm. Concerns about the draft proposal, and then submit a revised draft proposal on the 28th? Well, I don't know if we need a revised draft or not. Maybe we just need to answer some questions and right. see what's I could, going on. I could, I'd be willing to vote on this, and, okay. and if, if, if the things that I'm describing can be addressed in an amendment process, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I just... Don't, I just don't want to vote on this thinking that this is the end of this and, and we don't re revisit how this would be administered and how this would work. That's all I'm saying. Before I accept the motion in that er to that end, I want to make sure that you're confident that you, you're, you know that to be true, that it can be amended to meet your, that's what, your that's confidence. What, that's what the, the first question that the lawyer you know, uh, responded to, saying that, yeah, we can amend it as long as we're not changing how it how or, or what it does. And my concerns are not about what it does. My concerns are about how we would do it. My concerns are uh, 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 revolve around secession, revolve around um, uh, perhaps even quorum. You know, and those are things that we would discuss amongst ourselves and decide that this is the way we will administer this. And I will yeah. entertain a motion to accept the draft proposal. I make a motion that we, ex that we accept this draft proposal with a, 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 a date to discuss procedure or amend procedures. Before I ask for a second, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that you're comfortable with that procedure. I'm not sure how this goes. Mm -hmm. So if we're not comfortable with the draft, let's not adopt it. If there are some questions you have, mm -hmm. give me some scenarios. Yeah. Like okay. the question two, I kind of like took some concerns I heard here, mm -hmm. I crafted a scenario and ran it by him and had to respond to it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So if you could craft me a few scenarios that capture your concerns or questions, I'll have him respond to the scenarios. Thank you. And uh, see what he says. Okay. 28th. So then the 28th. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll go with, the, we'll go, we'll we'll go with the continued discussion on the 28th. And in the meantime, email Rob your concerns. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Could we also add a vote on the 28th then as well? Mm -hmm. Discuss yes. and vote. Yes. 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 And it'll be on the agenda, yeah. discussion and a vote. <coughs> and, an, and potentially a revised draft. Mm -hmm. Right? Potentially. Yeah. If, potentially. If potentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. May not be. Yeah, I mean, if there's some reason to revise it, he, the way he crafts these things is to allow maximum mm -hmm. flexibility mm -hmm. and to make it as easy as possible to administer. Because mm -hmm. nobody wants to spend endless hours doing extra meetings. So right. that way, and that's why he needs school committee. Okay, so you have school committee meeting some night, and then when it's over, you call this. the trust fund meeting to order, to just take care of your business, which probably take half hour, 45 minutes to listen to reports, find out where the money's going on, make some decisions, and you're done. So, like, you know, so there's not extra meeting time and so forth. Lawrence. So, uh, yeah, my concern with an amended draft, and this is with due respect for your concerns, is that if we have an amended draft, then we could get into a position where there are other members who are now concerned about the amendments and the revisions that have happened mm -hmm. with that. So I think at some point it would be great to get Rob scenarios, get some clarification from the attorney, and then once we get back the clarification, then make a judgment based on the clarifications of the actual language we have. 
Okay. Annie? I was just wondering, is, is now not the time to talk about those procedures? Because if that's something we're going to talk about, shouldn't we just do it now? <coughs> I'm sorry, do shouldn't what? Shouldn't we just talk about those things now? Like if there's a question about succession or, or mm -hmm. whatever Trevor's questions are. It's like, on the table for is discussion, it now the time sure. To talk? <laughs> so, um, yeah. uh, Shabazz? So, I'm wondering, and I'm not clear in this document where it identifies who will be the investment server service provider. What okay. is the investment policy? The question of are there any t uh, tax liabilities to this, or are we completely exempt from that? Uh, totally exempt from tax liabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, because this is a trust fund as part, one of the funds of it's the regional fund. school committee, uh, we would be using the same tax ID number, tax, same tax exempt number. Okay. So it's, it's, still, it's still part of the regional school financial package, if you will. Then we have other trust funds for scholarships and stuff like that. This is a special trust fund because it's irrevocable, which means the money put in here can only be used for those uh, liabilities, for benefits for employees. You can't use it for some other purpose. That's why it's a special um, document. It's a special type of trust fund, but still part of the regional school's uh, financial package. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. So. Um, Article 2 talks about the administering by a board of trustees, and that being the school committee members. And the administration of the trust fund is in Article 3, um, where, okay, I have a vote. And, okay, so what does it say, the um, treasurer? I thought it was up front. While you're looking for that, yep, like Maria, go ahead. While you're looking for that, Rob, the other thing around the policy is that once this is voted, then the policy subcommittee needs to create a policy. So yeah. um, that's part of the process that your, represent, your representatives would need to work on in the subcommittee. Okay. Yeah. Yes, so um, Annie, did you have your hand up? You did. Yeah. That, that's what I was asking. Okay. To discuss okay. it now. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Rob? Um, so, uh, which article is this? Well, article yeah. 5, um, 7, where it says a trustee may require other trustees as well as other parties to the agreement to execute a release after an audit of the trust fund. Mm -hmm. right. I think that should um, um, not be a may, but that should be a requirement after a term, that there is definitely a, um, a release that after, you know, uh, uh, my term as as trustee and school committee person is over that I have a release, you know, from everybody. I think that may require, you know, should just be, you know, common procedure. Yep, that, that can be um, a, a policy yeah. of the tr of the trustees. And and so. It doesn't have to be in the trust document, but you can make a policy that policy. that's how you. And that's what, that's why I'm describing, yep. and that's where we're in murky water of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that some of my things can just be addressed in terms of what the right. policy mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But when I read some of these so articles, it seemed like um, some of these things were, were too generic and should be dialed down. Um, another one that I looked at, and this may be you know deb debatable or controversial, but the quorum of um, one half plus one, I think it should be at least one half plus two, um, only because one half plus one could be one town, deciding the whole trustee thing. Right. Uh, um, that is me. article. Go ahead, Trevor. That's Article 3, Article 3, um, number 2, or is it number 3? No, it's three, number three. 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 3. Article 3, number 3. Okay. You know, one half, well, you can read it. One half plus one of, of the then sitting trustees shall constitute a quorum. Mm -hmm. So for us, that's five, and for us, that could just be Amherst. And so I think it should at least be, you know, or one half plus two. Simple change. Okay. Um, if I'm oh, I was just oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. That's right. If I go back to your, your previous back. question, mm -hmm. I think that's addressed under Article 4, Number 1A. Okay. One of the duties is to establish policies and rules pursuant to which a trust fund is to be operated and administered. So that's where you would say, you know, you'd have to have a release. Okay. Article 4, 1A. 1A, yeah, yeah. 1A. Okay, the operation. 
All right. So, yeah, that's, that's covered that we have yeah. the, the right to dec decide how that would happen. Right. Kathleen? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say it's the answer to Shabazz's question on page 3C and page 4F, right? Because we would say, does C basically mm -hmm. say that we, we can hire people to mm -hmm. yeah. do the work? And then, and then F says that the, um, the APRSD treasurer or another person would be custodian? Yep. Is, that right. what you're, is that what you're asking? So if that then is, is determining all the guidance that determines the invest the external consultants or invest um, investment service provider, if that is the guidance, it's basically saying the treasurer will do that, not the trustees. Is that what I'm reading? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the trustees give up any claim over who the investment service provider will be. Well, Article four. Which which one? I'm, I'm just asking what Catherine said. I'll, oh, I'll, it's I'd like four. Rob to answer mm -hmm. Shabazz's I'm question sorry. first. I, 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 the, the charge would be to maximize returns at the lowest possible risk. That's a general guidance to all treasurers for cities, towns, and districts. Um, and it's pretty much how the state association of treasurers works. Okay. So. I don't see anything going terribly awry here. <laughs> see some very conservative people. Now, um, you can decide uh, that we want a policy where we are going to just invest it with um, the state OPEB fund. Or maybe you will decide that you want to hire an, ex ex an outside investment advisor at uh, you know Fidelity Company or whatever mm -hmm. uh, and invest through that. But then the discussion you will have is, okay, what kind of fees are you going to be paying for what kind of risk? And so that becomes a, a larger question. Um, I don't think you need to nail that in here. That's something you decide as we go along as to what you want to I do with it. Yep. Lawrence. Um, I just guess I need a clarification. We have a treasurer right now, mm -hmm. and the treasurer is, to some degree, managing our finances mm -hmm. yep. in some capacity. Yep. And uh, we we trust the treasurer. We do. Uh, I'm comfortable with giving the power to the treasurer. I don't. I guess I've only been on the board for a year, so I I just, in all my watching of school committees, I've never heard of an instance, even here, where uh, we have the school committee start to manage the responsibility of a treasurer, the professional who we've hired to do that. Is that correct? Is True. That, so I'm prepared to trust the treasurer with that responsibility. Uh, short, obviously, if the treasurer does something illegal or of any sort of <laughs> egregious, then, then we'll step in. But, mm -hmm. but um, I, I will be honest. I'm a high school teacher. I don't have knowledge of investments. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm prepared to hand over that responsibility to the treasurer. And I'm hoping that we hired someone who's capable of that. And I don't think we would have the treasurer investing the funds. Right. Yeah. The treasurer finding the pla right place and person or venue to invest the funds on our behalf. Right. And they're right. doing that right now in other capacities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Rob, if I could ask for a follow-up on that. My understanding that if we hit the quarter million mark, mm -hmm. you can then take our trust fund and piggyback it with the state. Mm -hmm. we, we can and apply... And at, at that point, their financial advisors make decisions about our piece of that overall trust fund. Is that correct? correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So we would apply to become part of that system, mm -hmm. and we would have an account with that system. Think of it in terms of like a mutual fund. We all know about mutual funds. So we would be buying a share in that mutual fund, which is the state OPEB fund. And so we'd have a separate account, and our money would be segregated and would grow with the rest of the fund. Um, and available to our use. Um, as I've expressed to you before, um, while I accept the responsibility of moving forward with this concept, there's a part of me, maybe I'm still a little close to 2008, um, that is concerned about um, the instability of the financial markets and what mm -hmm. it might do to us. If we were to join the state, um, is there any? are there any kind of state safeguards to further um, protect 
um, whatever monies we have in our trust fund? Uh, don't, the, there'll never be any guarantees that you won't take a hit with market downturns. Okay. Um, what you look for is uh, track record, you know, how they do in the last downturn compared to other investment vehicles. Um, they, again, the charge for public monies is to get the best return at the lowest risk. Okay. So this is not a hedge fund. This is not, you know, a, a startup fund. This, this is like a broadly diversified fund with, you know, everything from, you know, real estate to bonds to you know, the whole panoply. So what we would want to do is look at some of those experiences that this group's had, which I understand is quite good, now, although I haven't looked at it directly myself. That's what I hear. And, and, and benchmark it. See, you know, is that place that they do okay? Is that reasonable? Now, you can't guarantee that you're not going to have a downturn. Everybody had a downturn. But how do they do compared to, you know, name your fund or name your um, retirement uh, group? So <clears throat> it's not our treasurer who at any stage in this makes those investment decisions. No. The treasurer simply identifies, prior to joining the state, the treasurer simply identifies what he or she believes to be um, the best investment institution for us to link up with. Correct. And so once we were to go to the state, then we become still further removed from investment decisions mm -hmm. about our money. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the state OPEB fund, for lack of a better term, has professional managers who manage the various types of funds that are within that fund. Um, yeah. And I guess one other question I would have then, um, and forgive me, I'm thinking about what little money I place with my financial advisors. <laughs> um, I have some choices to the kinds of mutual funds that I can divide up my assets in. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to go to an independent investment financial advisor, we would make those decisions as to how to divide up the monies into various funds. No. I would suggest no. And I would the same suggest thing would we have be a true professional uh, right. investment advisor. The same thing would be true with the state. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But even if you went to a Fidelity right. to have our own little thing, you'd want a licensed, registered financial advisor making those kinds of uh, suggestions. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Which then, which then comes back to the question of um, this way, the wording of this current document. So right now, that places the sole authority or custodial rights of that decision making, not to anyone on this board, not to you, but to Mary Wallace. Does that make, is that, I hear my colleagues point, well, doing it for everything else, for our, for yep. our accounts, why not yep. this one too? But well, I, still, and I still feel the question, does that make sense? Um, well, I don't think she would be operating in a vacuum. I think she'd be coming to this uh, to the board of the trust Doesn't fund require that and, su though. and suggesting, you know, here's what I think we should be doing, um, and makes sense. Show you some evidence as to why. Uh, goes ahead with your blessing, invest it, and then gives you quarterly, semi-annual, annual reports as to how it's doing, what the returns are, what that looks like against a benchmark, so that you have feedback as to whether it's <coughs> working the way you want it to work or not. It just doesn't say that in the document. That's my point. Kathleen. I actually have a question because it does, what does E mean on yeah, page e four? Because it kind of does say that in what terms of giving on us E on page four to yeah, invest and reinvest any money in the trust fund as the trustees see fit in their sole okay. discretion. Okay, yep. So that seems like yep. power that we actually don't want. That's a good question. Let me con con well, con that's, that's clarify the debate, that. whether we want it or not. Oh. But it seems to be in here that we have it. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. Rob, Rob, let me clarify that. That's Rob, a real good point. Rob, excuse me. Rob, let Rob answer, please. Go ahead, Rob. Let me clarify that. Because I can think of a reason why it would say that. Because you may not want to have this fund's investment at the vagaries of um, lay people who really don't understand how it works. Mm -hmm. um, and you may want to protect the um, fund 
uh, free fiduciary responsibility by removing yourselves from that equation and leaving it with a bonded professional. Trevor? I, I agree with you, but I'm thinking that it's enshrined in this document that who the professionals are mm -hmm. is up to us as the Board of Trustees to decide. And I'm looking at E and perhaps even um, JKL that describe that, to delegate any of the minister, ministerial powers and duties, including but not limiting to the investment and reinvestment of any monies in the trust fund to any agent or employee engaged by them or to any one or more of the trustees themselves. So that's saying that if you wanted to be foolish, you guys could try to invest it, <laughs> invest it yourself, or you could find somebody you consider a financial prof professional to invest, right. invest it mm -hmm. for you. But I'm not seeing this as saying that it is the treasurer that decides who that financial professional is. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And I, I hope I'm not insulting you, that I'm, I'm second guessing who you think it would go to. But I'm just saying that it, it, the way I read this, that would be up to us to decide who it goes to. Is that right? The way I read that, yeah, it could be. Mm -hmm. um, the way it was presented to me by the attorney, this is the way it's done, the easiest way to do it, what others are doing, is just having the treasurer <coughs> continue with her job. But that would, that would be us uh, uh, voting. We want the treasurer to decide who does it. But we could vote to decide, look, I've got this firm, and I've got this firm, mm -hmm. and this is how I invest my money, and Kip has his person at Fidelity, and we all compare notes and say, are any of them better than who the treasurer uses? I, 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 if I may, I, mm -hmm. I don't think that's either the intent or the spirit of the language for precisely that reason. Mm -hmm. We would probably have a m much lengthier conversation than we're having right now about who to designate as our investment or financial advisor for this purpose. <coughs> I think the so designation of the treasurer in this instance is perhaps a bit of a stretch, but in the same manner that we delegate responsibilities to the superintendent mm -hmm. on our behalf mm -hmm. to operate the school district. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case, um, it's common practice, I, as I'm hearing, mm -hmm. for school districts to um, designate the treasurer, not as someone who makes the financial decisions, but who identifies an even better, mm -hmm. more suitable um, individual or organization to make those financial decisions for us. Mm -hmm. So it's not at all unlike no, any saying. other employee that the school no, committee is either directly or indirectly responsible for who we designate to perform certain tasks for us. I, I, that's the way I see this as playing out. Maria and then Rob. So I think it might be helpful if we get some clarification around that language mm -hmm. because I think um, it's not clear to people because, I mean, and I think we all have our own opinions about how best to go forward given that whoever's on the board that's now, is not, we have to build something for the future. So we want someone who is expert and who does this for their work to be involved with making decisions versus us, t if we are, I were in that position, taking on a responsibility for investing a district's funds when I'm, that's not my, mm -hmm. you know, we want the best person to do it. The question is, is this language clear to how this, this decision takes place? And it doesn't sound like it is. So I think having the attorney kind of tease out for yeah. us, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What is the role of the treasurer? If the treasurer is involved, what does it mean for, would be helpful. Right. I think we're still, you know, it's hard. There's, Rob? There's an adjunct piece to this that answers some of these questions, and that is the investment policy. The investment policy is pretty much standard throughout the state, at least. I've looked at them from a dozen um, cities, towns, school districts, and there are pretty much the same wording, the same structure. Most of them look exactly the same. Uh, some of them change the order of things. Some of them like rearrange them a little bit different, but it's pretty much all the same stuff. Um, because there's two sections. The first section is how do you invest short-term stuff? And it's a list of what's allowed by law, mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty <coughs> prescribed. And that's what we're actually doing now. Uh, and the second section is how can you invest long-term uh, funds, which are typically trust funds, um, which we are not doing right now, uh, but it's also quite prescribed by state law. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the how would you invest it, where would you invest it, and so forth, is pretty much determined already by law. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's going to narrow the scope of the questioning, although it doesn't take care of all the questions you have for sure. Uh, but 
that's a, that's the other part. Trevor. But yeah. um, respectfully, Maria, mm -hmm. this language is not com confusing. It's not that there's no, questions yeah. about it. This language is literally saying something slightly different than what you guys are describing. You guys are describing that the way it works is the trustee do, is the treasurer does this, and this language is saying the way it works is we decide who does it, and normally that mm -hmm. person is the tr trustee. So I don't think this language needs to be changed. I'm comfortable with being the person that decides mm -hmm. to let the trust to let the treasurer decide. Mm -hmm. But I want to emphasize that that's not the way it has to go. That this language is giving the board of trustees the right mm -hmm. and the privilege um, as being trustees to make that decision. And if we so decide as a board that that's the, the trustee, then that's a decision we should make. But it shouldn't be baked in the, I don't think, this is just mm -hmm. my opinion, mm -hmm. that it shouldn't be baked in the cake that there's a board of trustees that gives all its power to the, the, the treasurer. And there's no need to have a board of trustees to make decisions. We've already written that the decisions are made by him. So I don't, I, I think this, this language is, is good. I just, I'm taking exception to how it's being characterized. It's not unclear. It's saying that we have the right to decide the trustee, I mean the treasurer can do these things. And if I may, um, I think as chair, um, given the fact that there are two members who are not here this evening, mm -hmm. and the length of time that we um, have spent discussing this, and it's been a, a wonderful discussion, very important discussion, um, I think in light of the fact that this is a, a topic that will probably entail still more discussion, and I do want to respect the absence of two mm -hmm. members of our body who are not here to participate, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Rob to come back on the 28th um, and um, with any suggested changes that you might have okay. so that we can continue this conversation with what I hope will be a full complement of the committee. I, I hope the committee will accept that move. Um, to a certain degree, we're, we're going over territory that we've already gone over, and I, I think, I'm not sure that's the best use of our time. Plus, I really do um, want to respect the, the absence of two people mm -hmm. and think that they could probably, would probably make very important contributions to the conversation. So I'm going to ask the committee to, um, to um, stop the current conversation. We'll continue this on the 28th. Rob, if you can join us with any changes that you feel might respond to some of the concerns, uh, then we can move forward. And um, I think um, for purposes of expediency, if we can put on the agenda both discussion and mm -hmm. vote just to cover uh, the possibility of a vote. Rob? Yeah, I, first of all, this has been a wonderful conversation, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen tonight, so thank you all. Um, thank you, Rob. And please, put your little ideas, thoughts, vignettes, scenarios into an email and send them to me, and I'll run them by the attorney and see what he says. We get more information, the better. Um, the more we vet this thing and poke it and kick it around a little bit, the better we're going to feel about it. So, I, you know, please. Anybody, send it to me. Um, the sooner the better. Uh, it sometimes takes a few days to get back. <laughs> they want to have all this information before that next meeting. Um, so I'll just keep that in mind. But this has been a great discussion. I want to thank you for it. And um, we'll take it to the next round. I would ask, first of all, I would thank the members of the committee for their understanding of moving forward. Mm -hmm. And also ask that you get any um, statements that you want to submit to, to Rob by a week from today. That would give you a week to mm -hmm. get things together for our next meeting on the 28th. Um, that'd be mm -hmm. sufficient time. Um, if we can get things uh, to him by, by a week from today, which would be the 21st, um, I, can, I think we can look forward to um, another stimulating conversation on the 28th about this. Assume thank you very much, members of the committee. And thank you very much, Rob, for your, pleasure. For your very um, informed contributions, too. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, if you note in your uh, packet um, near, near the end, um, there is um, a um, sheet which um, references um, something that I think every school committee um, looks forward to doing, and that is acknowledging the exemplary service to the children of the district. And in this particular case, we have a, a motion regarding the awarding of um,
clerical and media awards to two members of our clerical and media staff. So um, prior to discussion, as always, I'm going to ask for someone to make a motion to have it seconded, and then I'll entertain any comments or questions uh, prior to the vote. Is there a motion? Lawrence? In accordance with the Unit B employee contract, the Amherst <coughs> School Committee approves clerical media merit awards in the amount of $500 each for Susan Warren and Jane Fitzgerald. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any seconds? Is there any discussion? I would simply like to say congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I think that um, to be to be recognized by your colleagues, uh, oh, there's really no higher honor for uh, any educator to receive. <laughs> Um, maybe the highest might be um, from students, um, but um, to be recognized by your colleagues is truly an extraordinary accomplishment. Annie? I, I actually sat with Debbie and um, Terry um, Ominsky. Um, Ominsky and um, read and went through all the recommendations, and it was just, it was so hard to pick even. Um, and it was great as someone who sits on school committee and we talk about all this up here to actually go into the schools and meet these people and, and uh, be able to tell them about their award was really fun because Debbie makes it look good. <laughs> so uh, thank you for all the support that they've given. It's just been great. Thank you. Trevor? Tell your um, hand. No? Yes, no? I just wanted to, to add my weight of congratulations to that. You know, that I felt uh, remiss for not saying something <laughs> when you asked. I was in the middle of trying to keep up with my clerical duties and make sure all these things were in my calendar. <laughs> so uh, uh, let that be a little tip of the hat and a nod to uh, 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 the, the clerical staff amongst us that help keep everything organized. I just wanted to add that. Um, I have a question. Um, do they receive any kind of, other than our comments this evening, will they receive anything more formally from the committee? Uh, and if so, what? They at the um, award ceremony, which is on June 17th, they will receive And it is, um, it's, it's a really a night that um, sort of makes all this hard work mm -hmm. worth it, along with graduation, yeah, I guess. I there are a couple of nights that really <laughs> make Six this work. Six good graduations fun, too. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and that's one of them that I would encourage um, yeah, my please. colleagues to attend if you can. Um, it's, and, and it also recognizes retirees that evening yeah. as well, mm -hmm. right? And so, right, yeah. so talking about people who've, who've given their mm -hmm. good service to the to the district and to the children of the district. It's it's an event that you really should put on your calendar. And, Debbie, and thank you, Deb. Time frame for that? Six, at what time is the 7 p.m. 7 PM at the middle school cafeteria, June 17th? Any other discussion? We have a motion on the floor, yeah, lest we forget. <laughs> Not hearing any. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please signify by raising your hand. All those opposed, it carries unanimously. Thank you very, very much. Um, next item on the agenda. Um, again, um, very positive. Not that we don't do positive things. But, um, um, contributions by generous people from the community. Um, I would entertain a motion uh, from the committee to accept these um, very generous gifts. Lawrence. I move to accept uh, $500 from Deborah A. Ritzer uh, for the Kingley Perry Award, and $500 from David A. Perry for the Kingley Perry Award, and $500 from Stephen and Brill Costaratus for the Kingley Perry Award, and $500 from Regina and Daniel St. John for the Kingley Perry Award, all equal in total to $2,000. Is there a second? I say. Trevor seconds. Any discussion? I do have a question, if I may. Um, can um, I'm embarrassed to indicate to state that I'm not sure I know who Kingley Perry is or Very was. Do I. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure. I believe he used to be a teacher. Before my time. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Any other comments? Kathleen, did I see Well, I just it? was going to ask, what is it? And 
you know, what's the award and who gets it and what's it all about? I'm not embarrassed. I don't, it goes to a student each year. Oh, a student, I okay. I do not remember off the top of my head what the award criteria is. It's been several years since I sat on the group that worked with those awards at all. Um, but I do believe it's to a senior. In, in Debbie's defense, um, after every graduation, I believe it's in the bulletin, there's, um, usually almost a full page mm -hmm. of scholarships mm -hmm. and awards that seniors receive. So your failure to remember one <laughs> out of um, really a f almost a full page of um, scholarships and et cetera, it, it's really noteworthy. So I, this is probably one of those many. Um, and a very generous set of contributions. Shabazz. Um, Maybe important for the record, given the donors continuing to contribute to this, it's described as award. The Kingsley A. Perry Award is awarded to a high school senior who is committed to furthering his/her education and who has demonstrated an exceptional interest and talent in the field of dramatic arts. Mm -hmm. This great. award is not based on financial need; it is given in recognition of a student's achievement in the dramatic arts and with a hope that their enthusiasm and talent will continue to enrich their own lives, life, and the lives of those in the wider community. Thank you. That should be in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor of um, accepting the gifts via the motion as stated, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to the uh, people who made these very generous donations. Uh, moving on to the next item. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, what you have before you are two policies um, that have been kind of hanging out there for a while. Um, these are um, changes in lang additional language only. Uh, to meet um, changed Massachusetts general laws. Mm -hmm. And so that they are, uh, they broaden or more inclusive uh, policies uh, than heretofore. Um, and I don't want to say it's, you know, modest changes. I mean, they're not insignificant, but there's nothing else, there's no other language other than the addition of the bold print language in both of these. So I would entertain a motion to accept, uh, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, my apologies. These are first reading, I'm sorry, excuse me. First reading only. Um, are there any questions or comments about any of the items before you, any of the two policies? I, I, Trevor. I haven't compared the two, but um, I'm understanding what you're saying is um, changes in language. What are some of the changes that have to do with, um, you know, gender specificity or, you know, can you give me an overview of, 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 of what was required to be changed? I know I can read it with a fine tooth comb, but you might know of the are, are, are you speaking about ACA? Yes. Yeah, it's just what's in bold print. Those were additions. So it's gender identity or sexual gender orientation. Gender identity or sexual yeah. orientation. The well, and then the second paragraph gotcha. is also uh, simply an addition. There have been no deletions, no other revisions to policy ACA other than those additions. And, and those additions are simply, have been made to simply meet mm -hmm. the standards set by the, the laws of the Commonwealth. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? If not, then these will come back on the 28th for mm -hmm. second reading yeah. and vote, yeah. correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Um, as you'll note, um, by his absence, Michael is not here this evening. Um, and I guess it's um, okay to inform the committee that um, Shootsbury School, School, School Committee has reorganized. Michael is um, the new chair of the Shootsbury Committee. And as I speak, uh, there is um, not a member of the Shootsbury School Committee representing that body 
here on the region um, as of this moment. So I will just give you a very quick update on the Regional School District Planning Board. Um, there really isn't a whole lot to report other than the fact that um, there are numerous subcommittees that are working both independently and collectively to put together various pieces of the regional agreement. Mm -hmm. um, the entire planning board will be meeting for an all-day session on Saturday, June 1st mm -hmm. uh, to come together and to kind of appraise what we have at that <coughs> point. Um, I have not had conversations with Andy Steinberg as I speak regarding anything more specific about the agenda for that date. He's pretty busy with Amherst Town Meeting. Um, but right now, the June 1st date is sort of the deadline for all of these subcommittees to come together um, and um, see what we have and what we can put together. I can tell you that um, the Education Subcommittee um, has been um, the recipients of a tremendous amount of work by both uh, Superintendent Garrick and Ms. Westmoreland, who have worked on an education plan that has simply knocked your socks off. Um, it's really an outstanding document, but incomplete at the moment. The Governance Committee continues to meet. Um, I understand that the Finance Committee is, Subcommittee is having some problems meeting, but should be ready by the 1st. Mm -hmm. And the other subcommittee that I'm aware of is the Timeline Subcommittee, mm -hmm. and I have a, an email out to one of the members of that committee regarding um, the logistics of November votes and when they will occur, town meetings and that sort of thing, but I haven't received a response yet. So there's a lot happening, but nothing really coming together just yet. It's just sort of like the pot is boiling, um, and we'll be ready to sit down for the first course on June 1st. Um, I think that's probably mm -hmm. the best way to, yes, it is. to describe it. Um, oh, you did a good job. Yeah. Comments <laughs> or questions? Not hearing any, then. Um, I will ask you to take a look at your calendar, um, and this is a pretty important moment because... Um, I'm going to ask Superintendent Garrick to um, talk a little bit about sure. some items that are coming up uh, <coughs> the end of this month and the month of June. Okay. Thank you. So we have a fairly packed um, calendar, which I apologize. I, I want to make sure you get a, a revised copy of this, too. We have, um, an, let's see, we have on the 28th, which is really the... Um, the, the date that's been really revised quite a bit. We have we will have the OPEB discussion and vote um, on that day. We also will have a facilities update. So Ron Blahanowitz will join us um, to share his work within um, um, facilities, transportation, um, and overall our, our building usage and, and maintenance. Um, we also will have um, the second read of our of our um, policies. And we will have a teaching and learning update where Rhonda will specifically speak about the middle school math. Um, and um, Mike, <coughs> oh, oh, of course, the Corral will per <laughs> pre present to us and perform for us. So they, and um, really, we should not miss that if you can make it that night because it's impressive. And then Mike Morris is going to come and talk to us and remind us of the evaluation timeline. <coughs> so we are at the, the last few meetings of our school year, and we have a very tight timeline in terms of the superintendent evaluation process. So again, we're going to ask Mike to come to refresh our memory of where we are in terms of process, forms, paperwork requirements from for the committee members, how the process will play out at the end, how the information will be compiled, and well it, when it will be presented to um, the committee, which the final end of the year um, evaluation will be on June 25th. So Mike will come, though, and lay that all out. We had a meeting today of our three chairs, and we went through the timeline just to make sure we were staying on track, as well as um, refreshing our memories of the new evaluation um, requirements for superintendents, which is, again, different from what, what we've kind of sat with in the past, and it will be, I'm sure, slightly different again next year when some additional elements um, come out. Uh, but we're on timeline, and we're, we're doing well. But again, next week, um, Mike will help us out. And I know, did everyone have one of the binders, if I could ask quickly? Mm -hmm. Remember where it had the district improvement plan and the the rubrics for evaluation. I think Kathleen, we're going to want to get you one. Yeah, I think I think everyone else has one. If you don't, for some reason, let me know because we'll want to make sure that you have that, so that um, we can just make sure that we have all the applicable materials for people to review. <coughs> um, also, 
we are looking at whether um, we want to use that date as the date for um, our retreat, um, whether we want to ask at do it at that same time. So um, maybe at, we probably should at one of our upcoming meetings talk about the agenda for mm -hmm. the retreat and some topics that might be of interest <coughs> to the, the committee members. So maybe we could even put that on. Um, um, I don't know if we can sit on the 28th, yes. Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, let me go from the last <laughs> backwards. Mm -hmm. um, I've already given um, Maria some suggestions for themes for the retreat that relate to um, the, the working and functioning of school committees. Um, I've already given her three or four themes mm -hmm. that I suggested. I would encourage you um, in the next maybe two weeks to um, submit any suggestions that you might have um, for uh, for uh, topics that we could explore uh, during the retreat. Um, one of the reasons, uh, if not the reason, why we're looking at the 25th is an assumption that once June is finished, people begin to mm -hmm. depart for various places, uh, if not the hammock in the backyard. Um, <laughs> and so um, it's probably going to be the 25th. Yes. So you might want to think about that. Moving backward, um, regarding the evaluation, and I know, Kathleen, you may not have a copy of it, but the rest of you, um, for very selfish reasons, I would plead, encourage, um, cajole, whatever, uh, all of you to begin looking at the four standards mm -hmm. and the associated elements mm -hmm. and how you might begin to think about um, evaluating Maria uh, on those elements. I think there are 42 total elements, so this. There's a huge amount there to, to, to ponder and reflect upon. And the reason why I, I ask you to think about it is because we are going to give you very, very strict, non-negotiable timelines for submitting your evaluation so mm -hmm. that I can then take it, um, score it, process it, assimilate it, mm -hmm. and convert it into both uh, a, a, a narrative, if you will, um, for the 25th. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be giving some very strict timelines, and I want to just forewarn you, uh, and they are not going to be non-negotiable. So um, I, I'm going to ask you to start doing your homework now um, so that it doesn't all come down on you, you know, the night before, and you have to pull an all-nighter um, like you did the last Many time you pulled ago. an all-nighter. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so just uh, so that you, you know what's coming down, this is one of those things that's pretty important uh, at the top of our mm -hmm. task list. So um, please, um, do your homework. <coughs> Annie? Will the forms be the same? Well, As, well they, the forms are different, in the, but the standards are the same. The, the forms are the same that's within your binder yeah. that you were given this year. Oh, oh there's yes. nothing there. Yes, right. and we are looking to make that a little bit more user-friendly and putting that on SurveyMonkey so mm -hmm. people can do that electronically, which will also help calculate. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to do it to submit it now. I'm just asking you to, to, I understand. to start I thinking yes. about it. So that As I'm thinking about it, right. I'd like to know yes. the framework and right. we have the information right. within right. the binder. Right. Yes, and if you have, um, if I may. Yeah, no, no. And if you have questions about you know, when you're looking at things and, and you want to ask questions, you can, you know, give me a call or, or Mike Morris, who's been really involved in this process with our school district and other districts, too. You can feel free to um, access that information. And Michael is very willing to help mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and certainly knows what he's doing. So he can give you expert advice. And I have a question about the retreat as well. Um, that is, uh, does that mean that, that they would start at four? Like, uh, uh, if we're thinking of scheduling, excuse me. Um, like school committee starts at seven, so a retreat, retreat no. would that be starting at four to six? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, we haven't gotten that I far think, yet. I think, <laughs> yeah. I, th I think ideally, yes, it would be something of some duration. Okay, all right. But, but we'll work. We'll work yeah. that one out. And I know that we also probably want to get um, Kathleen information around the new member orientation right. piece right. too, and right. whether that is just going to the MASC MASS no. or doing another. But well, we can talk about that one okay. too, so you have all the info. Sure. So when you said um, th suggest topics for the retreat, like what do you, what kinds of things do people talk about at these retreats? Are you talking about like, um, you know, educational content topics that that no. sort of thing, or are you talking no. about 
No, Mo we, these have uh, these topics sorry, have more to do with the inner workings of the committee, okay. our relationship with the suit. Uh, they're, I don't want to say they're generic topics, but they're topics relevant to yeah. the machinations of the school committee. Okay. Our relationships with the superintendent, how we work together collaboratively, collegially, mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and how we can improve that. Um, po uh, one of the themes that I um, suggested uh, has to do with uh, policy development, which is one of the most important tasks that we can engage in other than budget and evaluating of the superintendent. Um, and there was one other one there. Role uh, of the school committee, relationship to the superintendent, and, and within governance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they really, um, okay. they really have to do with um, elevating the level of our functioning. Okay. Not that it's low, but you know, how can we improve? Thanks. Jeff? I would like to suggest that we can add as a topic to the retreat um, uh, some of our resources and how to better use them. I know um, the Center for Collaborative Education is mm -hmm. a resource that I just signed a warrant we pay money to, but we barely use. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have a conversation about how we can use them, how we can bring them in the fold to um, um, share some of the things that we do with them and get a <coughs> benefit and get some of the things that they do. Um, you know, I've tried to start that conversation but haven't gotten very far. I think we should talk about that at the retreat. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up because that reminds me of one other thing we need to do. I hope we can do it by the 25th when uh, some of the um, uncertainty about membership plays itself out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to reorganize. And mm -hmm. so, for example, we need to identify <coughs> perhaps new representatives to the collaborative, uh, negotiating team members, policy committee, subcommittee, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. chair, um, vice chair, all of those things need to be uh, reconsidered, I hope, mm -hmm. no later than the 25th. Right. And hopefully by then, um, actually, uh, shoot, was putting Shootsbury aside, when do the other, when, do, when, does, shoot, when does uh, Pelham reorganize? Um, I don't think we put it on the agenda. I think, if I, if I may, yeah, sure. um, I think Debbie mentioned today that yeah. to talk about reorganizing at your next meeting, which would yeah. be the 6th. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it has been put on the agenda. Uh, yeah, she hasn't she crafted hasn't it, it yet. yet. She just mentioned okay. it today when I saw her for the three chairs yeah, I meeting. I hadn't heard anything about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, I there's, there's going to be some uncertainty continuing for the next couple of meetings. And Leverett doesn't. Well, Leverett, we're meeting Thursday night, the three of us, okay. to reorganize. Mm, um, like we're three. two people shy. Yeah. One. Yeah. One board members. No, no. Mm -hmm. I think you have a write-in now. I think you have a writing. What happened to Catherine? I think you oh, also did. Your town moderator. Dan Rob. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Okay. Daniel is on our school board. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. All this stuff happens. Yeah. So, yes. Go ahead. And the last thing I would say mm -hmm. is we typically do not meet in the month of July as a board unless there are some extenuating circumstances and then we get back into our work heavily in August. So just so everyone knows that picture. Okay. Are there any other items people wish to bring forward? Not hearing any, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Oh, sure second. <laughs> Kathleen seconded. <laughs> um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. See you in two weeks. <laughs>